Okay, why don't we go ahead and get started. It's, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mike Reed. Many of you know Dr. Reed. A little bit of background. Uh, uh, BS in biology from the University of Texas Arlington. Mm -hmm. PhD from the University of Texas Southwest Medical Center. He's been at Harvard in the School of Public Health. He's been at Baylor in the College of Medicine. And now he serves as the chair of physiology here at the University of Texas. Thank you, Jody. Um, this is, I think, my second, maybe third time to come over and talk to this group, and I always appreciate the opportunity. Um, over here in Exercise Science, you guys have a really strong appreciation for the nuts and bolts reality of muscle biology. You're used to thinking about it in real world terms. It's part of your discipline and part of many of your research. So it's fun to come here. Um, ground rules, I really, really hope that if you hear me say something that doesn't make sense, or if you want to stop and ask a question, just raise your hand, or if I don't see you call out, I think this is a lot more fun if it's interactive rather than just you know, a talking head to the front. Our laboratory is interested in things, processes, <coughs> insults that limit muscle function. Um, I've spent most of my professional life in medical schools. We're interested in things that, that cause muscle wasting or muscle weakness or premature fatigue in patient populations. Um, our laboratory worked for 10 years when I was in Houston with NASA. We were very interested in processes that limit muscle function in the astronauts and uh, crew members in, in lower orbit. And um, so most of this is, at the cellular level, focused around free radical biology. And so, what I'm going to do today, what I thought I'd do, is just give you a little talk about sort of an, a theme that has run through our work over the last 20 years or so. Um, it's not comprehensive, you know, we, we do a lot of things that I won't talk about today, but th this is a story that I like. Um, and I, heard, I think I heard some people here talking about the Country Music Awards last night in Nashville. So, of course, I created a talk that's mostly centered around that, but I think that's not real. Um, but I am a Texan, born and raised, and so, you know, growing up in Texas, we're pretty simple-minded folks. Things are pretty cut and dry in Texas, you know. You've got things that are good, Dallas Cowboys. You have things that are bad, Washington Redskins. <laughs> you grow up with this understanding, and I think it's really well reflected in the genre of the time that I saw as a kid, which was Cowboys and shows and Westerns. And in those sorts of TV shows and those sorts of movies, it was always easy to know who was the bad guy and who was the good guy. Because the bad guy had a black hat and the good guy had a white hat. So this is evident imagery that can be seen. And, you know, Go to Google Image and find bad guy. And if you find bad cowboy, you're going to have a black hat. Even somebody as good as Peter Fonda normally, with these crystal blue eyes, could be a bad guy if you gave him the right hat. Conversely, a guy with a mask could be a good guy if you gave him a white hat. So this made it really easy for me growing up to relate to film and movies and the media. And that same sort of simple-minded logic was easy to apply to my field of muscle biology as we began to work in this area and try to understand what free radicals are doing in muscle cells. So free radicals, as most of you know, are bad things, right? So these are highly unstable, very reactive molecules. These are, these are basically dissolved gases. So superoxide anion, for example, is diatomic oxygen, O2, with an extra electron. Um, hydrogen peroxide is water. Right, it's H2O2, um, nitric oxide, all the free radical species that we think about as reactive oxygen or reactive nitrogen species, very small, freely diffusible, and highly reactive. They, they undergo electron exchange reactions easily. Because of that, these molecules can lead to damage to proteins, to lipids or fats, and to DNA, all of which are essential elements of cell structure. By damaging these molecular species, they can cause cellular injury and even cellular death. And so free radical mediated processes, often called oxidative stress, 
are linked to a variety of processes that most of us don't want to think about. Aging, cancer, heart failure, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and scads of others. So that makes it an interesting thing for us in the, in the world of uh, medical research, and especially in the context of understanding muscle. Conversely, antioxidants are a good thing. They prevent free radical damage. <clears throat> they derive from natural products. So we all know about the antioxidants and fruits and vegetables and red wine and stuff. They can be synthesized. So by synthesizing antioxidants, you can target these antioxidants or concentrate these antioxidants to get them into your body and to get the right balance. And generally, in our culture, they are thought to promote youth and beauty and to oppose disease processes. So, consistent with that, <coughs> skeletal muscles produce free radicals. Um, what I'm showing you here are data related to reactive oxygen species. That's one of the two major free radical cascades. So the reactive oxygen cascade starts off with superoxide anions, and then it goes to hydrogen peroxide, it can make hydroxyl radicals, and a whole cascade of highly reactive derivatives. And then that's partnered with the nitric oxide cascade, which I won't talk about today, but also plays a role in muscle. Let's focus on ROS. In resting muscle, reactive oxygen species are low inside muscle cells. So that's evident over here. Um, this is a graph which shows release of free radicals by isolated muscle preparation. So on the y-axis, this represents the release free radicals into the extracellular space by muscles in a bath. And under low, con under resting conditions, under passive conditions, these preparations release a little bit of free radicals, but not a lot. And then if you stimulate the fiber preparation to repetitively contract, what you get is a big increase in free radical release by the muscle cell. Now, these free radicals, this assay, doesn't tell us which free radicals it is, so to figure that out, what we did is we put in an enzyme that I'm going to talk about some more during this talk. It's called SOD, or superoxide dismutase. That enzyme is useful as a tool because it is very selective. It degrades superoxide anions to hydrogen peroxide. So that makes it a useful tool. And if you just add this superoxide dismutase to the bathing medium around the muscle, you can largely abolish the signal. Most of this increase is gone with the addition of superoxide dismutase. What that means is most of this signal is actually generated by superoxide anions. You get rid of the superoxide anion radicals, and you get rid of this signal. So this showed that muscle made a lot, released a lot more superoxide during repetitive contraction. Now, these higher levels occur not only during exercise, but Ironically, muscles make more free radicals when you unload them. So prolonged bed rest, astronauts in microgravity, um, that sort of condition will cause anti-gravity muscles to make more free radicals. We don't fully understand that, but that's the observation. <clears throat> and then also in inflammation, so in these chronic inflammatory diseases we were talking about, or in muscle injury, muscle will make more free radicals. And these free radicals can cause muscle weakness, they contribute to acute muscular fatigue, and they are opposed by antioxidants. So I don't have time to talk about all the different applications of this, but given the fact that the men's basketball team played their first um, demonstration game last night, and given the fact that the season is coming up and folks are excited about it, I figured we would take this free radical story and talk about it just in the context of acute muscular fatigue because that's pretty relevant to exercise science and it's certainly ex uh, relevant to this time of year. These are some data that were published, geez, almost a quarter century ago. At the time, they were revolutionary for those of us in the field because of the history of this story. In the 80s, we had data which showed that muscles made free radicals. It had been measured in live muscle, it had been measured in human muscle, and we knew that when muscle exercised, the concentration would go up. And then there was a decade where people added antioxidants to the system, fed antioxidants to their subjects, ate fruits and vegetables and vitamin pills, and tried to buffer these antioxidants and thereby improve performance. And for an entire decade, they were spectacularly ineffective. 
nothing ever worked. You never improved performance. So by the end of the 1980s, people were coming to the conclusion that oxidative stress was not a cause of fatigue. It was just a byproduct. And so it wasn't really relevant. Until this paper was published in the Journal of Applied Physiology in 1990. This was published by a person who is now a faculty member at the University of Kentucky. He was at Case Western at the time, Jerry Sapinski. And the experiment was fairly straightforward. Um, Sapinski and his colleagues took anesthetized rabbits and attached the, a section of the diaphragm to a force transducer. Vascular connections intact, stimulated the muscle by the nerve, and caused the muscle to fatigue with repetitive electrical stimulation. So let's walk through these data. There were two groups of bunny rabbits, both of which had comparable forces under baseline conditions. So this is force on the y-axis versus not. During repetitive contractions, the control animals, which received a saline infusion, the force of their diaphragm fell over time with repetitive contractions, classic muscle fatigue. And then when the stimulator was turned off, force began to increase. In contrast, the bunny rabbits that received a drug called N-acetylcysteine, this drug, it was infused intravenously, it was given to the animals under very controlled conditions, and if they received N-acetylcysteine, when they were stimulated, when their muscle was stimulated to contract, it fatigued much more slowly. This was the first evidence that antioxidants could slow the fall of force during fatiguing exercise. It was a revolution for us. And so that curve right there really set the rest of us off to understand this in greater detail. So we did these same sort of experiments in vitro with a muscle fiber bundle, and we saw the same sort of thing. If you just put NAC in the bath, you could inhibit fatigue. And we later then went on to do this same exact sort of experiment in ourselves and our friends under uh, clinical conditions where we took healthy people and we gave them either saline or we gave them an acetyl cysteine. The, elect the, the um, experimental system is shown over here. Electrical stimulator, just like the bunny rabbits had, force recordings like in the bunny rabbits. Um, we used a different muscle, so we used tibialis anterior with superficial electrodes over the motor point. The foot was attached to a force plate that had a load cell on the back, so when you stimulated the muscle to contract, the foot could pull up on the strap, but it couldn't could have moved, so instead we just measured the force that was produced. So it's very similar to the experiment that Dr. Sapinski did in bunny rabbits. Under control conditions, you could see a progressive fall in force over the course of 30 minutes that was really pronounced in the first 10 or 15 minutes, and then sort of plateaued. And then in the same people, at a different time, if you gave those people in acetylcysteine, that fall in force was blunted it fell more slowly, and the muscle sustained force at a higher level for a longer period of time. So this was the first evidence in humans that antioxidants could oppose fatigue. And those are the data that we can ask the Now, this is all well and good, but these are you know people laying on a gurney with, electrical, with electrodes on their muscle. What does this mean for real world exercise? What does this mean for <coughs> volitional exercise? Those experiments logically followed from this sort of work. And in fact, there's a whole array of published papers now in the archival literature which show that in acetylcysteine, this particular drug, inhibits fatigue during volitional exercise. Now in some cases, this is exercise of small muscle groups. So somewhere that here's hand grip exercise, we did that. Somebody else did human diaphragm strength and fatigue. Um, somewhere else, yeah, see quadriceps endurance. And then conversely, Mike McKenna um, in, let's see, he's in Melbourne. So his group has done work with uh, humans on bicycles and shown that during whole body cycling exercise, um, trained cyclists got a benefit from an system. So this has become a fairly robust phenomenon and it's led many of us to continue studying this trying to find something other than this drug. It has side effects, and it's a drug. And you don't want physicians there all the time. What you'd love is if you could find some sort of nutritional supplement or some sort of less complicated way to get the same effect. So for example, Dr. Black in the back of the room currently, right now, is doing experiments in cyclists to see if a nutritional supplement from soy protein might have similar beneficial effects. That again is a whole area of research that is active and ongoing 
But let's not go there in this talk. I'd like you to come back to the basic muscle biology. And let's talk about this in a little more detail. So to sum up the first part of the talk, this black-white story holds up pretty nicely. Um, muscles produce reactive oxygen species. Reactive oxygen species depress force during fatiguing exercise. Conversely, antioxidants buffer reactive oxygen species, and antioxidants preserve force. Isn't it a tidy story? Yeah, but it's not the whole story. Um, it turns out that the field is a little bit more complicated than this. So let me show you some data that come from about the same time point, historical data from the 90s, that are a little bit different. Now, I've chosen some data from Oba et al. This was a group working in Japan. And they were studying frog limb muscle. And what you see in the top tracing here is repetitive stimulations of an isolated frog muscle. And so this is a very slow tracing. So here's a contraction, contraction, contraction. And then periodically, they would speed it up so you could see more detail. And then slow, contraction, contraction, and speed it up so you could see the detail. So they were just changing the speed of the chart recorder. The contractions were happening at a regular rate. Now, if they added hydrogen peroxide, this is the stuff in the brown bottle that's probably in your medicine cabinet, right? So they added hydrogen peroxide to the bathing medium. And look what happened to force. Over time, this is five minutes, 10 minutes, force progressively increased. If they gave more hydrogen peroxide, uh, from 1.5 mol millimolar to 6 millimolar, force increased even faster over time. And this phenomenon is not just one, a one-off event that the Japanese found. This was observed by us in mammalian muscle, by the ova and frog, Lawler et al. came along down in Texas a &M. They saw the same sort of thing, and other people said the same. Conversely, so that's what happens if you take resting muscle under passive conditions and you add reactive oxygen to the system. What happens if you take resting muscle, your muscle right now, and you, ex and you deplete reactive oxygen, you selectively scavenge just reactive oxygen species, what happens to force? Those data are shown here. So you remember I was telling about superoxide dismutase? This is a live cell assay that measures oxidants inside intact muscle fibers. So these are happy little normal muscle fibers in the back. Under controlled conditions, there's a fair amount of oxidant activity that you can measure. This is low, but it's present. If you surround the muscle or if you add to the bathing medium superoxide dismutase, you can decrease this signal, cut it in half. If you bathe the muscle in catalase, you can virtually abolish the oxidants that are in the cytoplasm. I only <coughs> show you this for two reasons. Number one, it tells you that this signal is mostly reactive oxygen species, because you can get rid of it with catalase or SOD. And it also tells you that SOD and catalase are useful tools, because with these tools, we can decrease the reactive oxygen inside the cell. All right, so keep that with you. Now what happens if you take these enzymes and you expose healthy frog muscle to these enzymes during contraction? <coughs> Those data are shown over here. These aren't my data. These were data that uh, collab, well, not really a collaborator. I was a visiting professor at the Mayo Clinic. And Mike Rainier was in Gary Seek's lab at the Mayo at the time. They were doing frog single fiber experiments. And I said, ooh, 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 we've been seeing this stuff in muscle, in mammalian muscle. Throw it in your system and see if it works. They were kind enough to do that. Here are the data. This is a twitch contraction by a single fiber from frog leg muscle under control conditions. And then that same fiber was exposed to catalase, catalase, and you get a decrease in twitch force. A different experiment where you take a frog fiber, here, another control twitch, you then expose it to superoxide dismutase, and again, it depresses force. What? You're telling me if I add hydrogen peroxide to a happy resting muscle that it makes more force? And if I get rid of reactive oxygen in a happy resting skeletal muscle preparation that it generates less force? It's confusing. Which one is it? Reactive oxygen good or are they bad? Do they depress force or do they increase force? I'm afraid that simplistic North Texas morality plays don't always hold up in biology. 
my son, who actually was born in Houston, has recently married this lovely, intelligent girl from West Bengal in India. And in India, they have a myth, a story, which is archetypal. It goes, it's said to go back to the Buddha. And it's the story of the blind man and the elephant. And this is germane to our data. Let me ask your indulgence for a second. So in this myth, the Maharaja invites a group of blind men to come and inspect an elephant and describe what this beast is like. So each of them comes to the animal and touches the animal and attempts to understand the animal, and they then report to the Maharaja. They say, oh, the elephant is like a spear. No, says the next, the elephant is like a snake. Not at all, says the third man. It's very much like a fan. Ridiculous, an elephant is like a tree. No, like a great wall. Not at all, like a rope. Each of them is right to a degree. None of their data are wrong, but their data are incomplete, which leads them to the wrong conclusions. The same thing is all too true in science. We all come at this big elephant called biology and attempt to understand it in our own way. And some of us are busy studying the tail, and we think it's a rope, and other folks are up here looking at the wall, and others are down here pointing at the spear. None of us is wrong, but none of us is wholly right either. So what if reactive oxygen species could have both effects? What if antioxidants could have both effects? Is it possible to integrate the data that we just looked at, which appeared to be contradictory? <coughs> To do that, we proposed a model which, so far, touch wood, has mostly held up. Let me show you the model. It's a very simple one to any of us who've done any biology. We all know that internal components of the cellular milieu, the tissue milieu, often have biphasic effects. Think, for example, about temperature, right? If your muscle's too cold, it won't work. If it's too hot, it won't work. Calcium, too much, too little, it won't work. Hydrogen ions, pH, too much, too little, it won't work. Well, maybe the same thing is true for reactive oxygen species. So here's the, here's the simple-minded model. On the y-axis, you've got force from 0 to 100%. So this is maximal force that a muscle can do. And across the bottom here, you've got the reactive oxygen content inside the cell. Now, under controlled conditions, we think that the muscle cell lives at point A on this curve. It's relatively, it has relatively low reactive oxygen content, so it's on the what we call the reduced side and not the oxidized side of this <coughs> uh, And this is your muscle now under passive conditions. So if we expose your muscle now to antioxidants, which direction will it move on this curve? To the right or to the left? Who thinks it will move to the right if we give it antioxidants? It's very great. Thank you very much. for Somebody raise their hand. How many think it will move to the left if you add antioxidants? More people raise their hand. Um, I have to agree with the majority on this particular one. If you add antioxidants, then the reactive oxygen content should become less. Well, under those circumstances, the force would go down, which is consistent with what Mike Rainier saw with his frog fighter, right? Conversely, if you add hydrogen peroxide to your resting muscles, there's this whole range of oxygen contents where the force will go up for a little bit, maybe it'll come back down on this side, but it won't go down at all across this broad range because if anything, you'll get a slight increase and certainly force will be maintained at control levels or above. So that kind of makes sense. On the other hand, too much reactive oxygen and it falls off the cliff over here. So this is kind of where we think fatigue exists. This is where we think toxic events happen. Maybe this is where disease causes <coughs> loss of muscle function. Right, well, this is what you call a model. It's a story. Anybody can make this stuff up. All you gotta have is a piece of chalk, or better yet, a pen and a cocktail napkin, and you can do stuff like this at night with your buddy. This isn't science. This is a story. It becomes science when you test it. It's actually, you could think of it as a working hypothesis, couldn't you? Something that's testable. So you could then go back into the laboratory to see if this is true. And what I'm going to show you is some really elegant data from 
from a guy named, <coughs> pardon me, Paco Andrade. Now, he also is on faculty here at the university. Um, he's in the Department of Physiology. He did this work as a visiting scientist at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden. This is the institute that gives out the Nobel Prizes. He was working with a guy named Holkan Vesterblad. And the data that I'm going to show you are single fiber data from mammalian muscle fibers, which look like this. This is a picture from Dr. Andrade. He was kind enough to share. What he did is he took single fibers and he tested that model that I just showed you. So let's walk through some of his data and how it relates to this model. <coughs> All right, so here's the model down here. You're already familiar with it. And we're under resting conditions at point A. <coughs> Dr. Andrade was stimulating this muscle fiber to contract electrically. And here you've got a partially fused tetanic contraction, probably 30 or 40 hertz contraction. You see force goes up over time. This is time. And the black bars are electrical stimulation. So this is point A on the graph. Then Dr. Andrade adds <coughs> dithio 3 atoll DTT. It's a reducing agent that has antioxidant effects on a cell. And when he added dithio 3 atoll to the bath, force progressively fell, coming down to this part of the, of the relationship. So this is consistent with what we had seen in Microneer's studies and others. But what Paco did that other people have to do is they tested for reversibility. So at this point, you don't know if this is just modulating muscle function or if you're just killing the cell, right? Any poison would do this over time. What made his work unusual is that then he would reverse what he had done, in this case, by adding hydrogen peroxide. So he adds hydrogen peroxide to the system, and he watches what this fiber does, and force starts to come back. So it moves back towards point A. So he went down the curve and back up again. <coughs> All right, let's go in the opposite direction. Let's take the resting muscle fiber under these conditions. Here's a force tracing under control conditions. He stimulated again as a control, and you can see that this is very stable over time. So it's not like this force tracing is drifting around. It's quite stable. Then he adds hydrogen peroxide, and force goes up, going from point A to point C on this relationship, consistent with what we've seen from other experiments that were done earlier, but in this case, it happens in the same fiber book. All right, let's go for the big kahuna. So what happens if you really hit it with a big hammer? So you get a lot of hydrogen peroxide, you add it to the bath, what happens to force? Well, here again, you start under control conditions, you take this passive muscle fiber, you expose it to hydrogen peroxide, and you get this. You virtually paralyze the muscle fiber it looks darn near dead. And this is a Lazarus effect right here because if you add dithio 3 at all, it comes all the way back. Which to us was really remarkable. And it reinforces the notion of this model that at least over short <coughs> periods, if you push the muscle way over here to the oxidized stage, you can depress muscle function and still have it come back. So this is not cell death, it is not cell damage is a change in contractile regulation of the healthy cell. So this is where we currently live in our world. We think that actually reactive oxygen species are essential for normal muscle function. If you take a mammalian muscle preparation and you stick it in the bath with catalyze, you can paralyze it. It doesn't generate any more force just by depleting hydrogen peroxide. So ROS are essential for normal muscle function. Depletion can depress force as well as, you know, depress force with too much hydrogen peroxide. So too much in either direction is a bad thing. And there are a range of tolerated levels up here at the top that your muscle is capable of working within and maintaining normal muscle function. This is kind of, this is kind of believed in the field. We're all on board with this at this point, not controversial. The next slide tells you sort of where the leading edge is and what we're currently trying to understand. The effects on force are complicated, and they appear to be reversible. For example, in that previous tracing where I showed you all of Paco's data, he had those beautiful single fiber tracings. What I didn't show you is that he was doing the single fiber work because he could measure calcium. 
in the same cell at the same time. So that drop in force that you saw with hydrogen peroxide, that could have been that you just prevented the calcium release. Maybe it was an effect on T2 pills or an effect on the SR, an effect on calcium release. No. The calcium transient was completely unaffected. If anything, calcium levels went up a little bit during those contractions. So it's not calcium regulation under those conditions, we think. In fact, under most conditions, we think myofibrillar proteins are the most likely target. What we find in animal models of disease, in isolated fibers from humans with disease, in extreme fatigue, fatiguing exercise, what we find is the loss in force appears to have happened at the myofibrillar level. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's something about myosin to the thick filaments, or it's something about actin to the thin filaments. And we don't know what that is yet. It could be the myosin heads themselves, because they have some cell fibrils that are regulatory. Troponin, you know, you, you know, troponin is a calcium sensor. It's what allows contraction to occur when calcium rises inside the cell. That molecule appears to be sensitive to react oxygen. That might be the gatekeeper. We're not sure, but that's a focus for research in our lab and other labs. <coughs> so the sites, and I put an S here because it's likely to be multifactorial. Science is never really simple. There, I'm sure that there are multiple proteins being affected. So understanding the sites by which reactive oxygen modulate force is important for us. JW. <coughs> what about fiber types? Is, you see any differences in fiber types between the Yeah, and, and in, interestingly, that has not been studied in much detail. There are a couple of papers that compare them. In our hands, it looked like fast fibers may be more sensitive to redox modulation <coughs> than slow fibers. Um, but that hasn't been studied really well. And that's a great question. So maybe this is stuff we don't know. It's stuff that people in our lab and lots of labs are working on. Are there any other questions? Then I want to quit by acknowledging the folks who made this work possible for our laboratory. Um, we've had the privilege of <coughs> doing this work at the University of Kentucky for the last nine years, Karolinska Institute, Baylor College of Medicine, Houston, and Harvard School of Public Health over the years. And we've had the privilege of being funded by a number of funding agencies, um, most recently the NIAMS, National Institute for Arthritis and Musculoskeletal Diseases, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, American Heart Association, and the National Space Mount Medical <coughs> Research Institute. Um, these are our current sources of funding for which we are intensely grateful, and I am very grateful for your attention this morning. Thank you very much. Questions? Piggyback off JW's question. Um, did you notice, or has there been any studies looking at the differences with the effects of reactive oxygen species on different energy systems or different like aerobic versus resistance training? Yeah. Um, yes, at lots of different levels. It's a very complex question. Where would you like me to start? <laughs> well, my interests are in resistance training, so if you want to entertain that, that would be awesome. Good. Um, so reactive, in resistance training, um, one of the common <coughs> beliefs in our field, which, which I, am, I subscribe to, is that the stimulus for muscle cell hypertrophy probably involves some mechanical injury to the cell. Maybe that injury is amplified by calcium and by proteases within the cell. But typically, um, the part of resistance training that is thought to stimulate hypertrophy is not the concentric limb, but the eccentric limb. And during the eccentric limb, you get myofibrillar ripping and intracellular damage that stimulates cellular hypertrophy. Um, that damage includes a transient increase in, in reactive oxygen production, oxidative stress to the fibers, sometimes an influx of neutrophils or macrophages to help clean up the damage in the cell. And so all of those processes have reactive oxygen <coughs> as a component of the milieu. And the belief is that reactive oxygen probably contributes to that repair process. So for example, um, 
muscle precursor cells, satellite cells, mm -hmm. um, are sensitive to reactive oxygen species and to um, signals <coughs> that trigger ROS production, cytokines, for example. So there is a cytokine called tum tumor necrosis factor alpha that we study a lot. Um, TNF is essential for normal muscle repair. If you don't have TNF, those precursor cells aren't activated as they should be, and part of that activation is ROS. <coughs> so we think that reactive oxygen is part of the repair process and probably is essential. Um, some work has been done on that, but mostly in the context of aerobic training. So I think it is very common at the training table for there to be a, a diet that's high in antioxidants, for there to be antioxidant supplements that are available for athletes. Um, data are beginning to come out over the last few years, which suggests that that might not benefit training, that in fact that might oppose training, because the response, that part of the training stimulus for your muscles is the free radicals that your muscles are making. And so if you tonically buffer that, if, you, if, every, if every day you're eating lots of free radicals and antioxidants and you're preventing that signal from happening, then your muscle doesn't know to adapt and it adapts more slowly. So I suspect that's true for resistance exercise. The data are stronger for aerobic training. Julie? What about the shape of your curve, of your model, with young individuals and aging? aging to it, does it just, does it change the shape of that curve at all, or? Well, we made the shape up, I don't know. Um, <coughs> but I'll tell you where we think it pushes you on the curve. We think it pushes you to the right. Because with aging, um, oxidative stress is typically thought to increase in aging. Um, you get changes in free radical production and changes in buffering of the cell. So, you get an increase in antioxidant content in muscle with aging. So that's thought to be an adaptive response to greater oxidant production. The mitochondria are probably leaky in aged muscles and you're more likely to get mitochondria-derived reactive oxygen. So we think in general, there are more ROS being produced and there are more buffers there to tend to them. But the system itself is shifted somewhat to the right, we imagine. No one has done systematic studies to test that. Sure. So you talked about uh, exogenous antioxidants uh, and how they show beneficial effects. So from a cardiovascular point of view, <clears throat> these large clinical trials give exogenous antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, and even as you suggested, uh, if you give them to uh, sports-related performance, performance may not be improved. Mm -hmm. So do these, I, my understanding is like it's better to boost the endogenous antioxidant system versus giving an exogenous mm -hmm. antioxidant because it's more physiological to help balance out the system. So do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, you're touching <laughs> on a fundamental truth that I glossed over completely in this talk, which is that antioxidants are not a unitary phenomenon. Vitamin C is water soluble. Vitamin E is lipid soluble. They both act by different mechanisms from one another, and they act completely different mechanisms from enacetylcysteine. Enacetylcysteine actually does what you're suggesting. So enacetylcysteine is a reduced thiol donor. The main antioxidant in your cells, anybody want to guess what's the main antioxidant system in a, in a normal eukaryotic cell? Come on, give it a shot. Can you think of any antioxidant? Vitamin E, vitamin C, what else? I gave you two. Uh, SOD, absolutely. There are two different forms of, uh, three different forms of SOD <coughs> in muscle. So yep, that's there. Catalase is present. There's a compound called glutathione. It's a small molecular weight reduced sulfhydryl uh, containing molecule that is present in your muscle fibers at almost millimolar levels, hundreds of micromolar. And that's the primary antioxidant in your muscle cells. What N-acetylcysteine does is it supports the resynthesis of that molecule. So it, it's substrate that allows the cell to resynthesize glutathione and maintain glutathione levels. So that's consistent with what you said. Um, 
what you'll find is if you go to literature and you do a literature search for antioxidant effects on exercise, the results will be all over the map. And that's because people use all different sorts of interventions that they call antioxidant. So it's act, the, the concept of an antioxidant, the mechanism by which it works and its biological <coughs> efficacy is highly variable, really diverse. And so you have to think about it a little bit. You can't just toss things at the wall and hope it's there. <coughs> when you were doing studies with N-acetylcysteine, were you like infusing it co continuously or is it a bolus type of <coughs> Pardon me. We've done it um, different ways. So in my laboratory, what we've done is a, an infusion or we've drunk it. So infusion is allowed in Europe. It is not approved for clinical use in the United States. We had to get special FDA approval to do IV infusions. <coughs> and we infused prior to exercise and then did the exercise. Um, we have drunk in acetylcysteine an hour before exercise and then done exercise. What Mike McKenna's group did in Australia is they infused the loading dose and then they, then they had a maintenance dose during the cycling exercise that they did. So all of us have done it in slightly different ways, but the effect, whether we've drunk it, infused it, loading dose alone, loading dose with maintenance, muscle fibers in a muscle bath, in acetylcysteine has been pretty consistent in the effects that it has. Um, but, so infusing it's really inconvenient and it's not approved in the US. Drinking it is also inconvenient and unpleasant. Um, if you are prone to emotional swings and you've just had this awful breakup with your significant other, and if you wish to do yourself in, do not use Tylenol to do that. First of all, you won't kill yourself quickly. What will happen is you'll wake up the next morning with a hangover and you'll feel like an idiot and you'll tell your roommate and your roommate will say, oh my God, you took all that Tylenol and we're going to the emergency room. When you walk into the emergency room, probably be a dead person walking. Because Tylenol, if you take enough of it, will kill your liver. Dr. Black will keep me honest on this. And so the first thing that they will do when you walk in the emergency room, if they learn that you have done this, is that they will give you n cysteine not for your muscles, but for your liver, to try to preserve it. Because the n cysteine will buffer the oxidative stress caused by metabolizing the Tylenol. Um, why did I say this? What was this germane to? <laughs> Wait a minute, there's a punchline to this story, I'm sure. Because Mac is really nasty tasting and smelling. Mac is nasty tasting and smelling. So you won't know this because you're going to be sick and throwing up a tube down your nose, and so you won't notice an acetylcysteine is nasty. But if you go drink an acetylcysteine right now, it won't hurt you. But it will give it will upset your your guts will not be happy. And so um, uh, it's, a, it's unpleasant in lots of ways that you don't want me to describe to you right now. And it's unpleasant in ways that astronauts do not want to experience in a spacesuit during a spacewalk. So we would like to find an antioxidant approach that is less disruptive to the gut. And we've tried dose response studies. We find that if we drop it from 140 milligrams per kilogram, which is what they do in the emergency room, if we drop that in half, biomarkers in our laboratory in humans look like it should still have effects on fatigue. That's an experiment we haven't done yet with the half dose, but we'd like to. What would be much better is if Dr. Black's experiments work and we can take soybean derivatives that don't upset your guts at all and have beneficial effects on exercise. So that's the direction we'd like to go. But you see, in acetylcysteine and reduced diol donors, they're about the only antioxidants that work. Vitamin E doesn't work, vitamin C doesn't work, and carotene doesn't work. Most of the nutritional antioxidants don't improve performance. Only reduced diol donors have systematically been affected. So that's information that we think is important. Why can't you just the dose in half to avoid uh, GI distress? <coughs> Most of it, yeah. Most of the symptoms go away. And the ones that persist are at very low intensity. Well, go ahead. Well, I, I said there is an article recently on using, proposing using MAC in tournament situations. Did you happen to see that? No. So what they were talking about was, like in a basketball, NCAA for example, mm -hmm. you have two games separated by 24, 48 hours, something like that. So up in recovery for the first game to get ready for the second game, considering using NAC to do that. And I just wonder if you had any, any thoughts on that. No, I can see the logic. You might buffer some of the damage that would happen after strenuous exercise, minimize damage, 
thereby <coughs> more ready for the second bout. Right? When would you would you give it? When's the best time to give it? Before the first game? Right after the first game? Just before the second game? <coughs> now we're all right. So this understand for the students in the room. This is total hand waving. All right, we're just um, talking. <laughs> and so I would I would guess that if you wanted an improvement in performance in a particular game, you would take it before the game or or at halftime. You know, you take it around the exercise itself because you'd want maximal reduced dials for that for that phase of your muscles workout. And the expect my expectation would be by the end of the game, you'll have metabolized all that and you're still sustained and used it all up and and so you've done what you can for that time. But if you took it after the game, what you might be able to do is prevent some of the oxidant-induced injury or damage to the cell so that it could repair itself. <coughs> it would have less damage to repair and therefore might be more uh, functional for the second game of the bowel. I've never seen an experiment that tested that. That would be a cool experiment to do. Have you measured oxygen utilization with this? We have, <coughs> we are currently, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> we are currently studying mitochondrial function um, from skeletal muscle derived cell lines <coughs> or, or mitochondria isolated from muscle in the context of a disease model. So we're interested in inflammatory diseases like rheumatoid and heart failure that cause muscle weakness. And we, we think that mitochondria are a source of reactive oxygen we're studying mitochondrial regulation now to understand it. And so we see changes in mitochondrial function and changes in oxygen consumption. As you might predict, JW, the oxygen consumption goes up because you're getting not only metabolic oxygen consumption, but formation of superoxide at an increased rate. <clears throat> so the expectation is that some of the increase, some of the increase in VDO2 that happens during exercise, it's a small fraction. But some of it is going to react to oxygen production. <clears throat> so that is a part of the physiologic oxygen consumption. Um, I don't think that antioxidants would prevent that. I think what antioxidants do is they act downstream of the ROS signal to buffer the ROS that are formed rather than preventing the formation of ROS. Now that's acute. Chronically, if you've got injury to mitochondria, then that obviously would disrupt oxygen consumption in other ways and might actually limit your ability to metabolize substrates or I was actually thinking in the context of you're you're talking about increased force, and whether or not this had anything to do with, in terms of the mice and ATP utilization, yeah. So whether or not it would change any of those relationships, yeah. you know, akin to maybe the beetroot juice stuff that we talked about earlier, or something like that. Well, I mean, isn't so that an interesting? So if you're story. getting increased force, where you know, is it coming from that? <laughs> I, you know, or is it is it an energy utilization issue that allows continued to uh, delivery of ATP to the myosins or something. So uh, under resting conditions, ATP levels are pretty stable and, and they're super maximal. So they don't limit performance in rested muscle. We don't think. And so when you get an increase in force in resting muscle with hydrogen peroxide, I don't think that we're increasing force by upping the ATP. Right. I think we're increasing force by some other mechanism. Um, that's not to say that the ATP effects are irrelevant or unimportant but I think they're more likely to be important during fatiguing exercise, where you could be protecting mitochondrial function during fatigue. And I think that's a real possibility. What hasn't been done is what I would love to do, and we left Boston before we could do this work, and I haven't <coughs> collaborated with anybody since then to do it, but we would love to look at phosphorus in MR spectroscopy, because with this technology, um, you can stick a muscle in this giant magnet that's normally used clinically for imaging, but you can use it to measure chemicals in your muscles in real time. And you can monitor ATP levels, ADP levels, inorganic phosphate levels, pH in the muscle fiber during fatiguing exercise, and you can watch the metabolic profile change. I would love to do that with an astrocyst. That, that's the experiment to do, and it hasn't been done to my knowledge. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Um, where do you where do you think all this has uh, its fit in sports? Like, for example, you're talking about basketball um, taking. If you do see benefits from this soy uh, thing that you're working on, um, 
would that be considered performance enhancing? Do you think it should be used on a competitive level or individual level? Or you use the word should. <laughs> <laughs> um, should means what I want to happen, right? So I don't think people should take performance enhancing drugs that could potentially damage your body or kill you. That's what I think about should. Athletes don't always have the same should that I have. Right? People who want a competitive edge will take whatever it takes to get that competitive edge. And so I think that as this field matures, and what you're hearing from Scott is that the, the, the exercise world is very on top of the literature, scientific literature. They watch us like a hawk. And if they see a potential advantage, they're going to start exploiting it. My knowledge in that steel system is not on the list for the IOC. I don't think they look for it. So right now, it's not prevented. And you can go to General Nutrition Center and buy an steel system in big plastic boxes. I will tell you that the amount that you'd have to eat to get what we found, you'd have to you know, buy one of these jars and go eat the whole thing. And then your guts would not like it. <laughs> but it's available, and it's not banned yet. And so it remains to be seen as to whether the, the Governing agencies will start to limit that. And I don't know, I, honestly, I don't know the truth on the ground. I don't know what athletes are currently doing. I don't know if athletes are using that. What do you think, Scott? Do you hear anything about that? I don't know anybody using it, but I'm sure I'm sure somebody is. Yeah. Any, anybody else? Word on the street, anybody using that? <laughs> yes. Um, I've never used it, but it's pretty popular. I mean, certain, uh, Bodybuilding circles. Is it really? Supplement. That's why I was going to ask. The major side effects you said were GI distress? Nausea, vomiting, flatus, diarrhea, all the good stuff. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, there's a few, I don't know, I guess rogue scientists you might call them, or armchair scientists sure. who write about it. Yeah. So, yeah, it's. I've seen it popping up on people's supplement lists. And in the lay literature or in the enthusiast literature, what what do what do what are these folks arguing for NAC? Why um, do they propose that it should be used? I haven't read too much into it. Uh, it mostly as an antioxidant yeah. and delaying fatigue was yeah. you know the two things they talk about. Yeah. I'm not sure how much they're using, if they're using the inductive <coughs> dosage or not. Yeah. That, so I haven't done this, but I think that would be a fun thing to sit and do with a beer one evening is just to go through Google and, and sort of do some searches and see how people are talking about NAC on the street because it, it's, it doesn't really affect our research, um, but it's interesting to know how folks are using this drug. Hey, listen, you guys have been very patient with me. Thank you very much, especially for your questions. Thank you for those. <laughs>